Welcome, welcome. Welcome to You Be the Judge. I'm Dr. Paul Dyer. Bridges presents You Be the Judge every Wednesday at 6 p.m. I would like to introduce my co-host. First, I would like to say thank you for all the listeners who come on to our show, who download the show. And we're beginning more downloads week by week by week. We went from last week from 100 downloads to this week to 120. Uh, it's, it's fascinating, Ooh. right? So who's downloading? Mm-hmm. I have no idea. I'm not data mining like Facebook, and I'm not trying to solicit them. But I do want you to know that we are here as passionate people, not and we have a purpose. A purpose is humanity. There's a difference between purpose and trying to sell something like suave shampoo. Nothing gets suave shampoo or nothing gets anything that tries to be sold. We're not selling you anything. We're talking. We're conversating. And that gets missed. A lot of conversation gets missed because people are trying to give or sell or to retrieve. We're doing none of that. We're talking things that we are feel passionate about, purpose about, and information that we know to be this. Now, do your own research. I always say, if you disagree with us, that's great, that's awesome, and I don't mind for you to disagree or whatever, but I want you to do your own reading, your own studies, because I don't want you to go to the bully pulpit and say, well, Dr. Paul said this, and Judge Claudia said this, and, and Maryland soon-to-be judge of the circuit court judge of Mar- uh, Montgomery County said this, and this is what I know to be true. Don't do that to yourself. Don't fall into being a sheep of sheeple. With that being said, (laughs) Marilyn Pierre, soon to be circuit court judge of Montgomery County. Welcome. How was your week? It was fantastic. How was your week, Dr. Dyer? Well, you know, I have, I do a lot of reading. Most people, so I have to, people say, well, I read a lot. Okay, well, okay, that's probably true, but I read about 2,000 words per minute. So, wow. so I read a lot. I, I actually go through about three, four books a week. And that has a lot to do with research and study and information and data. Because that's what I like to read. I don't read nonfiction. I don't know why. It's not like I dislike nonfiction. And I have written some nonfiction novels. But I am a reader, researcher, scientist. That's what I do. And re- oh, you mean you don't read fiction? No, I don't read fiction. Right, right. But oh, I, okay. But I, but I, but I wrote a fiction novel, mm-hmm. a love story, and Ooh. yeah, and um, but so I. Well, let let I'm sorry. Let let's introduce Judge Barber, and then after that, we could go into. <laughs> and <you know. laughs> Judge Claudia Barber, my other co-host, welcome, please. Yes. Yeah, so thank you very much. So, so happy don't... to be here. <laughs> Oh, good. So, so you don't. I don't read, read fiction. I don't read fiction. Wait, which I find that a lot of fiction actually have a lot of nonfiction in it. Correct. And, and I want to mm-hmm. bring up a couple of things that has been ringing out in my ear when people say things like rebels, patriots, revolutionaries. It all depends on the perception of where you're coming from. Mm -hmm. So when people say, I'm a patriot, it's been coming up in this week of reading that people consider themselves patriots of what? Of what they believe. That's understandable. But it's hard for people to say that you're not a patriot of the United States because you disagree with them. And, And that has been hurting me on a personal level because... Because I disagree with you doesn't make me a non-patriot. And I think people weaponize certain words to utilize it against the few when the masses believe in something. And, And I think, I hope our show corrects that. Because we're not trying to argue with you. We're trying to state what we think and what we have read. And what we believe that doesn't make us not patriots because we get attacked here on New Be the Judge. I keep that away for you, two lovely ladies. But we get attacked mm-hmm. about the things we say and how we say it. And I, I am not ever going to defend against an attack 
because it is our belief, our opinion, and our study, and our smarts. We're not, well, we're not matching I, your smarts. We're not disagreeing with who you are. But we want to let you know that this is how we see it. Does that make sense? Yeah, and, and I welcome a dialogue. Because just like you said, we're not here trying to say that we're right. We're saying that this is how we feel. And if someone else feels differently, I, I think I would welcome the opportunity to have a mature discussion <laughs> with whoever that person is. And who knows, I might learn something. That person might learn something. But I think just the name calling is, you know, sometimes disarm, disarming because it's okay to have a different opinion from someone else. And if you could defend it, great. If you can't defend it, then, you know, name calling is not going to help at all. You must be an yeah. attorney. Who that? <laughs> uh -huh. Because I, yeah. I, I, here's and here's our problem with things that are going on in the media, which is media meaning someone is meeting the between between what's actually happened, what and what's actually being disseminated. Mm -hmm. That's the media. It's between two things. Two things, right? So just like Judge Claudia Barber, people have said things related to you that was completely false. But yet it was pushed in the media and it seemed to be factual. We need to stop letting people know that just because you think you heard something, you may not know the fact. I would say, what do you say, go to the horse's, what's the saying, go to the horse's mouth? Yeah. And, and also the disparity is so large sometimes in terms of who has the big bullhorn and who doesn't even have a whistle. So, so sometimes somebody is out there shopping, um, shouting from the top of the mountain, and, ah, and then someone at the bottom of the mountain is trying to talk the truth, but no one is able to hear that person over or that shouting. Judge Barbara, you are very quiet today. Well, I'm, I'm listening, and... Um... Uh, the, the fact that uh, just because the media puts it out there, we, we've got to correct that. You know, just because the media puts it out there, it's a, it's right. <laughs> no one should ever think that way because a lot of times the media has it wrong. They have an incomplete story. They have a half truth. And sometimes they have totally inaccurate information out there. And we, well, have, to be able, oh, sorry. we have to be able to decipher the truth. Mm -hmm. You have and to. Also, so, oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't mean to talk over you. And sometimes they reach a conclusion and you say, from what? I mean, you just told me what happened and you can't necessarily reach that conclusion from what you said happened. Well, ladies, so, I have to tell you, I don't know if you know, but don't look behind you, but you're media right now. Yes, absolutely correct. So, absolutely correct. So, we, we have to curtail ourselves, right? That's, I mean, that's what we do. Yes. I mean, uh, us three, we do that because we discuss what things are going to go on and what we're going to talk about, and we still have our own separate opinions. But we are technically media. Yes, but we're not, we're not uh, uh, to the extent. Uh, uh, it, it's a different kind of podcast, uh, free, uh, freely stated opportunity for us to convey messages uh, that uh, may not be part of mainstream media. Uh, and uh, to that extent, uh, it's an open type of forum. It's an open opportunity for us to share what's been, out, oftentimes, what's been out there that in mainstream media that needs to be corrected or changed. So our purpose in conveying our messages uh, is because a lot of us here are change agents yeah. and we want to be change agents. We want you to see the other side of the story. We want you to see what needs to be perfected. We want you to see what needs to be changed for the betterment of the community and for the betterment of the of society. Yeah, that's also another reason why I want to discuss the topic that we 
decided we were going to talk about today about what has been happening in this one county, Davenport County, uh, Tennessee, and how that has affected the criminal justice system. So now that we have enough of our friends here, can I play the video? You guys know how excited I get when it comes to you know, sharing screen. <laughs> so here we go. There we go. By ProPublica and Nashville Public Radio has uncovered an alarming pattern of arresting and detaining elementary school children in one Tennessee county. Lisa Desjardins has the story. Everybody can hear Rutherford okay? Rutherford County, Tennessee has detained a record number yeah, of children yeah. as young as seven years old in past years. Some were arrested for playground fights, others for cursing. In one 2016 case, four elementary school age girls were detained for failing to intervene in a fight. A disproportionate number of the children involved and arrested were black. Mariba Knight from National Public Radio is the lead writer on the report, and she joins us now. Thank you so much, Mariba. The focus is on this one county, Rutherford County, and an attorney there told you at, at one point some 500 kids he thought had been arrested by mistake, and another 1,500 detained over a point of time uh, as part of a jailing system that seems like it was subjective. Uh, essentially, at, one, at points, police and judge were deciding on how the kid looked or how the kid was acting in a moment, whether they would be detained. At the center of your story is the arrest of 11 children surrounding that idea of a fight, who intervened, who didn't. Can you explain exactly what happened with those kids and, and how? Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Um, essentially, you set it up really well. There were 11 children in all that were arrested for watching a fight. Uh, the two that were actually involved in fighting were so young, five and six, that uh, they weren't culpable for their actions, but the other children were. And they were arrested under the charge of criminal responsibility, which as we outlined in the story, was not even a real charge. Um, it's a prosecutorial theory. So one can't be charged with criminal responsibility. One can be, say, charged with assault under criminal responsibility. But that's just the beginning of kind of the myriad mistakes that happened in this case. Uh, so yeah, they wound up arresting 11 kids in total using this charge. Uh, there were uh, a, an eight-year-old with pigtails arrested and handcuffed. Uh, a sixth grader fell to her knees. A fourth grader threw up in the assistant principal's office when she found out she was being arrested. It was just a terrible, terrible experience for these children and a terrible moment for this system. But it really shined a light on what was happening. Help us understand the role of those in power who seem to even create this system, an elected judge, and then also police officers. How did this happen? Yeah, so these arrests, as you outlined, took place in Rutherford County, which, as we write in the story, had been illegally arresting and jailing kids for years, all under the watch of one judge, juvenile court judge Donna Scott Davenport. She has been the county's only juvenile court judge since 2000 when the court began. And she has a really outsized role. She oversees the courts and she oversees the juvenile jail. And up until this incident, she directed police on what she called our process for arresting kids, which basically was every child who was arrested, even for something minor like this or like truancy, they must first go to the jail. The judge told law enforcement this explicitly in a memo. This is not normal routine procedure with children. Um, then the second part of this is that once they got to the jail, they were subjected to something called the filter system, which was implemented by the jailer, Lynn Duke. And that was an overly broad assessment of what a child was deemed, whether a child was deemed a true threat. I can talk more about that, but it was overly broad, it was illegal, and it was happening for decades. You know, there's a lot of discussion about this topic of what incarceration does. The judge in this case has argued on radio shows that this policy was meant to build character and that kids would come out of this detention system better. What did you find about how kids were affected? Oh, I had an interview with one child who simply said to me, 
We are not coming out better. Uh, This has affected children in so many ways. We opened the story with this mass arrest. The the children involved in that, many of them had to go to counseling. They were lucky enough to get settlements from uh, the county where there was money earmarked for counseling. But I talked to them and they had bad dreams. They were scared they were going to get picked up at school and arrested again at any moment. Um, There was another young man we spoke to who was kept for four days and denied his medication for bipolar. After he was released, uh, he was put on house arrest, and he tried to commit suicide three times in the coming year. So the impact on this children is real, it is ever-present, and it is wide-ranging. Is this still happening? And have there been any repercussions for the people who put this policy in place? There have been no repercussions except for the settlement. Uh, Some of this has been stopped thanks to federal judges intervening. When lawyers have brought class action lawsuits, they have forced the filter system to stop. They have forced solitary confinement to stop. But the architects of this system are still in power. The judge is still the judge. The jailer is still the jailer. And there's also other mechanisms of oversight that are woefully inadequate that we outline in the story. Uh, Just one example is the Tennessee Department of Children's Services. They license juvenile jail across the state. They inspected this facility twice a year and never once did they flag this illegal system. And it was right there in black and white in the manual for this facility. So yes, there's been some consequences as far as money and payouts to families, but the architects are still there and the systems of oversight are still inadequate. Such important reporting. Mariba Knight of Nashville Public Radio, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. I already have a lot to say. I'm just going <laughs> to say it. Yeah, go ahead. First of all, this is slave patrol, all right? I'm just telling you what? straight up. Did you say <laughs> slave patrol? Slave patrol. We should have a slave bell. Slave patrol, I said it. We should have a bell. Every time it has something to do with slavery, we should ring a bell. Ding. For sure. Yeah. And, oh. and, and see, this could stop in a man in a nanosecond. Because mm-hmm. if this were Donald Trump's children, this would not be happening. I'm going to tell you that right now. Now, the other thing is the fact that, that she acknowledged that this was illegal. And they're getting by with this nonsense. Now, first of all, if the governor was aware of this, he can put a stop to this with an executive order and and, and basically put it in place and say, if you do this one more time, Judge Judge Barber, you're going to be incarcerated. Slow your roll. Hold on. How can a governor not be notified? Exactly. Well, that's my question. I mean, as as a legal mind, and I'm not a legal mind, I'm a human mind, is it, is it possible for a governor to not know? Is it possible? That's it's my terrible. question. It's disgraceful. It's it's abominable. And you know, I I um I lost it when I I, I watched I just saw that. I just really lost it. It's 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 an abominable situation, and to the extent that it happens and it's still happening, the and the same people in power. Now, first of all, we need to start with that judge. Outrageous! So outrageous. How did she even get appointed, and why is she still in power? Why is well, she uh, even it's still I, I, doing something illegal, and she's not removed from the bench? Really? Well, actually, that that's a point that they like. If you outrage by the video, the video is same compared to the article, which is it's so worse. You get a chance to read the article uh, with the links that I sent. Yeah. Oh my God. It's even, worse. Even even the Twitter uh, 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 um, posts were really bad. Well, first of all, I, it said it was Davenport, Davenport County and some other part of County. It's Judge Davenport. And she, the first time she ran, she ran in a contested race and she won. But every other time after that, she has, every other time she's run, she has run uncontested. It goes back to our point that this is what Terrible. happens when you have a system where judges run uncontested. And well, that's what I'm going to say now because Bernadette and me too wanted to 
say something. Well, hold on, Mitchum. Well, I, 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 I want to get to the legal issue. I, wanna, I, have a, I have a question. I have a question here. What is criminally responsibility? What does that mean? For I, someone else's action. You're criminal. They, they, they charge the kids with being criminally responsible for someone else's action. Okay. There is, there is no such charge. That's some convoluted charge, trumped up charge. That's, you know, no different than uh, arresting and charging uh, the black women on the Eastern Shore with a hate crime for, okay. for, 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 you know, uh, tearing up Donald Trump's uh, campaign sign. <laughs> so, and, and the other question. Outrageous. And the other question is, is what is the legal age? that someone can be charged with. Because when we talk about a fourth grader, nine mm -hmm. years old, eight years old, what is the age limit? Someone Can anyone be charged? Anything. Like a baby. I mean, I, I'm going to the extremes. Can a baby be charged? Well, under their convoluted system, it's all about what they're getting by with. Because if the information she's sharing is saying that it's illegal to do what they're doing, you, you need to stop right there. It's illegal. How is it that it's able to continue? It's illegal. And that just shows you that 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 laws are just words on paper. And if uh, unless you have an enforcement mechanism uh, such as jailing and 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 incarcerating people or fining people for their behavior, there is no effectiveness <coughs> in your laws. And that's the number one reason why uh, uh, the late Congressman John Lewis said that Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, when it was first passed, wasn't tough enough. Wasn't it's just tough, yeah. it's a bunch of words on paper. Discrimination happens every day, every day in many, many workforces all over the country. It's everywhere. And to the extent that, you know, you have a law in place and, you know, uh, most employers uh, have a dismissive attitude about the law anyway. Uh, but the but the bottom line here is that uh, whether, you know, just as um, Dr. King said many years ago, be true to the words that you're putting on paper. If all men are created equal, don't lie about it. You know, be truthful about it. And to this extent, this is, you know, this is ridiculous. This is an outrage. I think Twitter and social media should blow that county up. Not and happening. The, and Twitter on blow it up in terms of a Twitter message. It's not happening. That this is illegal. It's not happening. Bernadette? You no. Know, I would like, this is a like, Hold on, lead. hold on, friend. I, I don't, friend. Bernadette, please. <laughs> Thank you. And thank you so much, Judge Barber, for your words. Um, you know, when you said this was, um, when you brought up slavery, it reminds me that, you know, I mean, isn't that the challenge that we have with the rule of law in this country? Mm -hmm. It's the confluence yes. of, of racism and brutal capitalism. Um, and that leads me to a question. It, I'm sorry if I uh, missed the beginning of the call, mm -hmm. but... Do we know whether these children were being put in a for-profit prison and who was who was benefiting uh, from their um, incarceration? Because, of course, it was even brought up in the Twitter th thread that you all shared that there have been other examples of judges having clear conflicts of interest, um, financial interests in uh, specific detention facilities and putting juveniles and among others, in those detention facilities, and it, it accrued direct financial benefit to those judges involved. Well, Bernadette, I can answer uh, a percentage question. 90% of all the prisons to date, of to date, are now are of we profit. To date. Now, mm -hmm. is this one of the 10%? I don't know. But 90% are. So that that doesn't really answer your specific question to this specific thing, but you can almost say like hmm, more likely than none, probably. And and I know Will, you have uh, you you have a statement, but we want to get to friend and then Mitchum. Then friend, go ahead. 
Oh, yes. And I'm sorry that I um, chimed in before. But I just wanted to know, because I'm not sure that it was brought out, what was the racial makeup of the children? Although children are children and shouldn't have been in that position anyway. But I would just like to know what was the racial makeup of those that were arrested? All 11 of them were Black. And uh, two police officers who were Black went to arrest them. One of them, there were two police officers who were Black who went to arrest them and one white police officer who went to arrest them. The white police officer wanted to uh, have the kids pulled out of school to arrest them. And one of the black police officers was like, no way, don't do that, that's wrong. And then another uh, police officer was sort of like in between, uh, 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 the other black police officer was in between them. To make a long story short, uh, the principal, sorry, the assistant principal was actually pushed and I, I bullied into getting the kids out of school, out of their classes, uh, the ones who were still there, to then to be arrested. Uh, which is why the kids say that they feel so unsafe at school because they don't know when they're going to be pulled out of class again and be put in handcuffs. The, the kids were totally traumatized. The black police officer who, who did not want to do this was asked, do you think that this would have happened had the children not been black? And he said that he didn't think that, you know, if the children were not black, that this would have happened. It, it's a really, really, really sad case. And oh, it's I, a form I, of I, slavery, just a form of slavery. And, and just I, call it what it is. Yeah, and, and uh, uh, the woman being interviewed, Miss Knight, I think her name is, she, she said that there was some consequence in the sense that there was a settlement. That's not a consequence because not a penny is coming out of these people's pockets. There's been no consequence at all for them. There, there's a consequence for the taxpayers who now have to pay more money, but not for these people. Ma- uh, and, and did I mention that she's running for office again? Her Davenport is running for office again well, this year. Well, you know, first of all, I, I, I believe she'll win again. Second of all, I don't want you to think who's ever listening to this in whichever county you listen to this, whatever state you're listening to this in, that this is only this state. Right. Check yourself. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, what's, what's, that, what's that rap song? You better check yourself before you wreck yourself. You better mm-hmm. check your county because this is going on also in your city, your county, mm-hmm. and your state. I mean, we have here, most of us, well, we know who where we live, but in Baltimore City, this is going on in Annapolis this is going on. So it's in Anne Arundel not- County, in Anne Arundel, I, I I was aware of uh, through the NAACP. They do report incidents yeah. to the NAACP, uh, and, and um, you know they have this uh, overly critical system and way to monitor uh, children. Uh, and and you know Anne Arundel County has had a huge history of uh, disparate treatment in suspensions and discipline, disciplining children throughout the school system, throughout the entire school system. Mitchum, go There's, ahead. I remember in Montgomery County, remember there was the, there was the, um, the story of the five-year-old African-American boy who was verbally abused on camera. And the, some of the African-American staff members in that elementary school were complicit in that verbal abuse. And I believe now, please, anyone on this call, correct me. Um, uh, Will Jawando was very much involved in getting police out of the Montgomery County schools. I don't know whether there are still police officers in Montgomery County schools. Uh, no, they're not. They're, they're not. They, look up. they have they have removed the IRS out of the schools. Great. Yeah, the school resource officers are no longer on there. What happens now is they're off. Uh, I'm I'm, I'm a little horrid mess. That's why you won't see my face today. Um, Thank you guys so much for, I'm sorry. That's not possible. (laughs) (laughs) Well, (laughs) thank you. But um, this, Dr. Butler, you boy, and I want to thank you for having this topic today. Um, One of the things um, to the young lady's point of just speaking, when that, um, that little boy, those weren't SROs who actually um, went and got him. 
he mm-hmm. there were those were police officers that were called in after the boy left campus mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. went and got that little boy and brought him back to the school and then harassed him as they did. And one of the things, and and and, and you guys might differ from me, it might be upset, um, but and I, I I'm looking at it from both ends because I deal with a lot of police officers. And one of the things that was said, and and, and I take this because do you want the system to get to our kids or do you want someone, and he could have done a different way, someone caring to straighten them out? Because if we don't straighten out our kids now, the system will. Well, that, my, my okay. response to that is, well, well, let, me, let me just finish what I was going to say, because I'm, 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 going, I'm going to the point I'm saying, so I think as an African-American parent with African-American children, that we have to teach our children. Unfortunately, our children cannot get away with everything. And in this system, this system is not fair. It is not, it's not fair at all. The kid can't be a kid. But unfortunately, we have to have to talk with our children. We have to teach our children. We have to, unfortunately, our children can't respond the same as the next child who does not look like them. And it's unfair, but it happens. And I would rather myself, because I believe people say they don't want their children. I, you know, I didn't want my daughter, and I should have. I said, I said, a whooping didn't hurt me because I am where I am today because I did get whoopings. I mean, when I say whoopings, and they, they can see our beatings now, and I got them. And I am where I am today because of some of those whoopings. Okay, so but- I just wanted to put that out there because so many people say, take, you know, I would rather, I'm glad my, they did that for me because I would have been one of those children not here, but possibly in the criminal justice system. I was that bad. I'll just say that. So, well, Mithun and Will will get right back to you. But I, I think the point is this. You have an eight-year-old who's being put in handcuffs. At what at what age did you give your child the talk? I mean, eight years old is, I think, a bit young to be giving them the talk. I, I don't even think that they could comprehend what's going on. So a police officer shows at your child's school and puts your eight-year-old in handcuffs. I mean, that is... Now, that's why I don't agree with that. But I yeah, do, yeah. So, so even that. if you even if you talk to your children, an eight year old I don't think is going to understand the concept of you know this is the oh, way you oh, act because you look the way you look. We we have to get to Mitchum. Mitchum, oh, what, what do you want to say? Oh yeah, hi. Thank you very much, uh, Doctor Dyer. And actually, um, I was about to say something, but you have addressed a couple of points. Actually, this was, I was trying to talk about what Ms. Ben, uh, ben, Benedita told. I'm, I'm sorry if I mispronounce your name, ma'am. Uh, actually, there may be these judges or uh, this uh, prison system may not be directly correlated, but it can be indirectly correlated, mm-hmm. where these prison systems, the owners will be paying a huge amount of donation for this election campaign for these judges. Mm-hmm. And that can be uh, like under the rug. Mm-hmm which is going to be considered as legal way of corrupting the judicial system. And I think Ms. Marilyn has talked about this and uh, we have talked about this before also. This is very outrageous things to see, especially for a person of color and their kids are getting this kind of treatment. And and I, I will say exactly as Judge said, Judge Barber said, Oh, uh, this governor must be notified. It's impossible that the, it's happening for 21 years. The judge has been there for 2000. So this is happening for 21 years, two decade plus. And so, if nobody knows about it, that's very unfortunate. And the problem is, I'm surprised why the attorneys in this county not Working together okay. and filing, Mitchum, filing, Mitchum, a, Mitchum. filing a case against hey. the judge in the federal court. Mitchum, Mitchum, I, I want to let people know a couple things. Don't be so wary or so surprised when things happen. What you have to understand is there's probably collusion. There's probably an underlining collusion or things that are happening because... I want them to happen. I may never show my face, but I'm spending money. My business are being profited. I'm getting a benefit. 
So we ask the wrong questions when we like, how can this happen? When we should be asking, who is allowing this to happen? And I know Will had had a statement or a question previously, and I'm going to get to Will. Will? I just wanted to complete, if I may complete my sentence, uh, Dr. Dyer. Yeah. Actually, I just wanted to say in Montgomery County also, uh, I think we I talked about this to Judge Barbara and Miss Marilyn. So there are a lot of underlying uh, so much bad things happening, I must say that, that I even have a, filed a lawsuit against the state attorney's office. Now my criminal charges are now handled by PG County. And they are doing a fabulous job than Montgomery County. And um, they are not even doing the right thing for a police brutality or anything. The state attorney's office doesn't do anything in Montgomery County, to my personal experience. I that, that's because Thank it's, you. it's probably not beneficial financially. Um, no, you're absolutely correct. And exactly, that's exactly what I said. I had a video evidence when I got assault. And, yeah. and state attorney's office totally denied that, saying that, oh, nothing happened. When I got the video, then they say, oh. It's not a uh, big assault. Right. It's only minor assault. Hey, so, Will, so, what do you want to say? Go ahead. Thank you. W- Will? Okay. I wanted to ask the same question that was asked before. Is <clears throat> is <clears throat> the judge and the and the police officers who uh, uh, <clears throat> were they discriminating or were they just generally evil people? Well, you 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 kind of touched on a topic that uh, Marilyn and I and Judge Claudia Barber we have mentioned sort of with, with each other is critical race theory, and what I mean by that is, is racism individually or is it collectively taught and brought forth in all the things that is done? Here's the issue we have with opinions, perceptions, and theories. I'll do that again. Opinions, perceptions, and theories. If you're a scientist like mine, all of it has something to do with an hypothesis, right? It has no conclusion whatsoever. So how do I come to my result? My result is I first have to dig, I have to first have to I have to dive into what my theory is. My theory is just my thoughts. My thoughts could be present. It could be bigotry. But that doesn't mean that my thoughts come out to my conclusion. But if all that I have is my thoughts and it is bigotry, then my conclusion will will, will set for, forth. That's confusing to people when we talk about Theory and and teachings. That's where Will's talking about. What are they talking about? How was it perceived? And how was it disseminated? There's a a serious problem with the elected officials who allow this to happen. And that's from the governor on down to anybody else that's elected to let this stand. Uh, You know, because... um, uh, they know how to they they know how to take critical race theory uh, in a nanosecond and punish uh, principals and whomever they think is spreading critical race theory in public schools. They know how to act on that in a nanosecond, and just like they know how to act on that in a nanosecond, they also know how to uh, prohibit this type of slave patrol from going on in this county. Mm-hmm. You know, it's that simple. Marilyn? They can put- oh, I thought Johnny wanted to say Oh, oh yes, I, I did. But so, first of all, I um, share everyone's age and concern over this situation. And I, and I have a question. Where, um, when did, did school stop becoming, becoming a saving for children? You, you, a parent will send their the children to, to school and, and place them in the, the care of whom? Is it the, is it the principal? Is, is it teachers? And why didn't they inter- intervene on the behalf of the cho- children? How can police go, go into a protected space and pull, pull a child 
out of and put him in jail. So um, there's a lot more more responsibility here. Um, Joni, place Joni, among Joni teachers. Yes, Joni. I'm going to pick on you because you're a friend, mm -hmm. and, and and it's really for the public. It really is for the public. It's not for you. Did your child have a police officer in his school? Um, no, no. Okay. And, 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 and most of you people don't know that Joni is white. And this, that, this, what I want to do is this. Well, is, I'm you're not white. You're, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I, I beg your pardon. I'm black. <laughs> I'm not white. Well, well, like I said before, race is just a, a theory. It doesn't matter. But I, I guess being that we i we are identified a certain way right mm -hmm. and and, uh, and and that's that's the issue we have with police officers resource police officers situations counties county executives we we all have this thing that it depends on where our kids go to school at depends on how it gets affected at and I think our question is not just for ourselves, it's for where we don't live or where we do live. I, I I've been, I, I, I've been, I'm sorry, Meryl, go ahead. Oh, no, that's okay, Joe. I actually have been in contact with Ohio more association with inner school children than with school uh, predominantly uh, white school children that go to predominantly white schools. So that that is not uh, my question. Con concern safety of all children. Mm -hmm. Fact that you put you send your your child school and place him in the care of adults who are supposed to teach him and protect him or her. And I I ask again. How can a uh, law enforcement come into to school and take a child out, out of school and place him in an unsafe space? And the child not have an adult representative accompany him to this place and come accompany him th through the process. I, I don't understand how this is condoned. How everyone who hears about it, it doesn't object vehemently to it. You, you, I went to the school. You can't come in and, and take my child out that I'm not responsible for out, out of place without his parents knowing about it. Well, that, the, that, mm -hmm. Yeah, and we, we understand your point, and that is, that is so true. As a matter of fact, the article talks about how one mother was asking if she could be there when her child was being interviewed during this process, and she was told no, and she didn't know enough to know that, you know, she could have asserted her right as a parent or even asked that her child not be interviewed unless there was a lawyer present. Marilyn, so sometimes we don't know our rights, which is why we are, we, we talk about these issues to educate and empower people. So, Marilyn, mm -hmm. can you, can you, I, I'm sorry, Joni, can you very mm -hmm. specifically talk about those rights of if I'm a parent, where I can be, where I'm allowed to be, where I'm able to be, because we don't know. I don't know unless you. Oh, well, if you're a parent, you're not allowed to be uh, present when your child, your minor child is being uh, interviewed in Maryland. You know, you have no right to be present there. However, you can assert your child's right to an attorney, and that's how you get them to stop interviewing your child. No. So so if you can't be in the room, and, and even if you're a parent, I, su I suggest that you get a lawyer anyway, because we had the video a couple months ago, remember, where we, where we learned that police, these officers do certain things. I, I hope everybody who was watching that uh, program remembers remember. remember the advice of police officer as well as a law professor who said, do not talk to anyone without a lawyer. So 
Yeah, can I, Bernadette was saying that uh, she was hearing an echo. Bernadette, is everything okay now? Okay. Okay. So yeah. So so yeah. So my advice, as I stated before, is just not to just to say, "Hey, you want a lawyer," and wait until you you actually have that lawyer in the, in the room to uh, to talk. This is Ruby Moon. I'm on by telephone. Um, could I make a recommendation? I, I wish so much that this group could write a pamphlet, a brochure, advising our youth on what to do um, when they come into conflicts at school. And if you give me just a moment, I'd like to tell you what happened to my grandson. He was at his locker, and a brown student walked up to him and said, there's going to be a fight today at school. And my grandson said, how do you know? He said, because I'm going to fight you. As soon as school is over, I'm going to attack you. My grandson went on to his English class, and he couldn't concentrate. He went to his teacher and said, may I see my counselor? The teacher called the counselor. The counselor was not in, she said, for him to see the assistant principal. Um, the teacher sent my son to the assistant principal. And as he told her the story, she said, oh, there's not going to be any fight. You, you're in high school. High school students don't fight. And she told the uh, security guard, to take him back to class. Well, after school, there was a fight, and my grandson was attacked. Um, he was sent home along with all of the others who, uh, all, all of them were called in the next day, and all who were in the fight were sent home. And they were told to write what had transpired. My grandson wrote out what had transpired, but his parents decided that they wanted an attorney to see it before it was turned in. They were not aware that it had to be turned in that next day. Consequently, my grandson was suspended from that school. He had to go to another school. He didn't like the other school, so he was absent a great deal. Um, it, it turned out well, the, the the principal got involved and didn't and uh, showed all kind of indications that he did not like my grandson. I called him, and he referred uh, my grandson to another assistant principal. Well, in the end, the first assistant principal that my grandson spoke to is now principal of a school. I, it, all of these are, are, are African American people. She's now principal of a school. The principal is now an assistant superintendent or something of that of that nature. My grandson, in the meantime, has been the one to suffer. He did not want to leave his home school and go to another school. We had a lot of difficulties with him. Um, he prayed to God and asked God to solve his problem. And his problem was not solved by God according to the way that he wanted it to be solved. So he turned on God. Well, we have him in a military school now, and I'd like to report some. He is going to be baptized this coming Sunday. He, he loves the Lord once again. But I wish that we could, from this group, if we could just write up something to help our black students and, and any students for that matter, to learn how to act in situations like this. Well, um, I just want to say that the ACLU has a wonderful brochure on what to do if you get stopped by, by the police. And I would check with, and it's excellent. I, I, I think that everybody should have it in their car. If they get pulled over, just uh, along with your license and your what, registration, you should also hand that brochure over to the police officer and you don't have to say another word after that. Uh, and I'm saying How that can we get that brochure? How can we get I, that brochure? I have it. I've actually texted to, I'm, I'm sorry, I've emailed it to people because we had a discussion about it one week. Uh, that's good. I'll, I'll, I'll email it to you. 
Um, I will also find out if they have something in reference to schools, because I, I do think that it's really important. I think that the school failed your, your grandson and they failed to protect him, and I'm sorry about that. Um, I also think that what um, Montgomery County has this zero tolerance policy, which keeps students from defending themselves. Because if you are in a fight of, under the zero uh, tolerance policy, whether you're defending yourself or whether you are uh, the aggressor, you both get suspended. And it's ridiculous because if somebody attacks me and I'm defending myself, why should I have to bear the, the same consequences that the person who attacked me had? And, and so this is something that we might want to look at as well. Hey, Marilyn, Bernadette, Actually, please. Yeah. Um, uh, hopefully, you you all will find this comment uh, helpful, and um, you know. But you know, now, I've now heard two comments, and um, and, a, and thank you so much, Reverend Moon, for for sharing that powerful story. But I've heard a number of comments, sort of putting the onus on the targets of state discrimination on how to conduct ourselves so that the state that we fund with our taxes doesn't abuse us. <laughs> I think the intervention should be focusing on the state, on the school systems. How do you need to handle the diverse people in this, for example, wonderful Montgomery County that pay their taxes for you to have your position in the school system? Part of it. What if they just don't care? See, you know what? I wonder whether we need to... Well, we need, I'm saying this very broadly, right. and we're all do, doing different things. Some of you a lot more than, than, than I'm doing certainly right now. Um, but we need to emphasize the state's interest in not being violently racist. And I know that's a very broad and simple statement, and and, uh, and 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 Bernadette, that's how it gets canceled, because it is broad, right? Mm -hmm. We understand. I I understand exactly what you're talking about, specifically what you're talking about. But when you put it on paper, it's so broad, and when it's on, so yeah. and when it's mm -hmm. so broad, it can be dismissed. Absolutely, absolutely. And so, those of us who've had advocacy experience. Um, look, if we go after the, those who, what, what works in the United States is people, entities, whether it's in the private sector or in the public sector, um, understanding that money is at stake. Mm -hmm. So if well, money, money from their own pockets, not state money. Exactly. So when, when these people do an action like that and the insurance pays for it, not a penny comes out of their pockets, they don't feel it. Exactly. We're thinking about accountability, uh, what direct accountability, as opposed to, oh, okay, well, the state is going to pay out that judgment. Marilyn, I, I have to ask you a legal mind. I have to ask you a legal mind. Well, you know, Bernadette is also a lawyer. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> so I, didn't, I, didn't, I, knew, I knew I was around some smart women and people. <laughs> I really did. So my issue is, is, is this a lawsuit? The answer is to me, myself, is no. Okay, well, I'll give you my standard answer, which is you could sue anybody for anything, whether you're going to be successful or something else. I, I, I think that, you know, the state, well, I, I say the state, because to me, well, tell me, yeah, they can't tell me for you. Um, what I'm saying right, is what I'm thinking, right, Dr. Moon? Okay, so the, the county is legally responsible to protect that child. And they have noticed that that child needed protection, and they did not protect mm -hmm. that child. So take it from there. I can't give legal advice because I don't know in, uh, in this case, since I don't know other ins and outs and things of that sort. But I do think that you know, if the county knew that this child was in danger, he basically mm -hmm. said, "Hey, I'm in danger," <laughs> and they didn't protect him. They didn't call a parent. Right. They helped him up. They didn't 
say we will escort you off mm -hmm. of our uh, property or escort you home, wherever it is your next stop is going to be. Well, but, but, recently, but recently that happened in Annapolis where a child said they were in danger to the principal. The principal supported it to the superintendent and the superintendent principal did nothing. And then a fight broke out and the person got stabbed. So well, like I like I said, the, the school we we give our children over to the school for a certain number of hours, and during that time, the school is supposed to protect them. And and sometimes the school doesn't know to protect them because they don't know that they are in need of protection. But in those two examples that we're discussing now, the school has direct knowledge that these children are asking for protection and the school did not give them that protection and they in turn ended up getting hurt. So what do you think should happen? <laughs> yeah, and I, I know that these people have immunity and maybe that's what we should talk about as well. I mean, it's one thing when you don't know that someone needs help and that person gets hurt. But when, when a child who is in your care needs help and you fail to protect that child, the same thing that would happen to me if, you know, one of my children, well, they're all adults now, but if one of my children got hurt when my child was a minor, the, the state would come and say, you failed to protect your child, so therefore we're going to take your child away from you. We're going to bring criminal action against you even. But, so why but, should that happen to the school as well? It, it I, seems like we can't take the child away from the school because the school is protected by the government. Yeah, but there are actions that could be taken against the government. And and that that's what we're I think Bernadette and I are, are saying that mm -hmm. you know, in this situation, take the action that needs to be taken against the government entity. Uh what we would like in addition to that is something that holds these people personally responsible so that, that way instead of being promoted, for instance, this person should have been demoted, you know, or maybe even fired or not protecting that child. Yeah, it seems there should be, be a chain of custody where, where I, uh, as a parent, give you my child for eight hours a day to protect and teach, and you have a responsibility to, to me. You are accountable for my yes. child's welfare. Yes. You know, so no so sense. We are in... Yeah some waters we are in some waters and the water yeah we are there's a, there's a lot to do and i think by talking about what we're talking about that that's the first step we need to identify what the problem is and work on the solutions and we're talking about some solutions right now which is we need to hold these people accountable uh because they know if, if they didn't know what to do, that would be a different issue. But right. they do know they what do to do because either. other people aren't treated that way. Other people don't have the, the negative outcomes for everything good that uh, we have and the, you know, and the positive outcomes for everything bad. She said for most everything bad that we seem to have. So, so the different set of rules for different people have been very damaging to us and all the statistics show it so it's not as if they don't know what to do they know exactly what to do they just have separate rules or separate ways of enforcing rules for different people and we need and i, I think basically what we're just asking for is just treat us the way you treat everybody else and we'll be okay with that we're not asking for special treatment we're not saying you know hold us and hire staff we're just saying okay you treat so and so this way we like to be treated that way too that. We know, it, I, I want people to read their history books. I want people to read history, history, all kinds of history. Read them all. And I'm telling you, we are reliving the same things that has happened in the 1800s. Mm -hmm. we, this is nothing new. And that's what's scary. We're probably asking and talking about the same conversations that people had in eating houses, sleeping houses, ale houses, and we still have not come up with the same solution. Why do you think that is? 
I, I thought it was interesting that today the uh, there was a report on, on uh, WAMU about how uh, Asian Americans as well as African Americans uh, feel unsafe, <laughs> you know, and they felt unsafe. It, it seems like for the last, they, they felt more unsafe uh, according to what I, I was hearing for the last four years. And the reporter was shocked. <laughs> he was like, oh, I'm so shocked that Asian Americans and, you know, and um, African Americans feel unsafe because she's like, hey, white people don't feel unsafe and the numbers that Asian Americans and African Americans feel unsafe. And, you know, I, I don't think the reporter understood that there are certain things that happen to certain groups that don't happen to other groups. Right. And uh, the same thing don't happen the exact same way as the 1800s. It would be hard to find somebody who's going to burn a course in someone's uh, front yard or who's going to hang a noose on the, on the, on, on the, on the tree. You'll find that, but it's, it's hard to find. But it's the other things that happen that that um, even though they're not as outwardly aggressive, they're still very much aggressive in the sense that the aggressive prosecution, the, the aggressive monitoring, the aggressive policing. Yeah, I, I, I just like to say, if you look at what happened on January 6th, when you look yeah. at how they breached the Capitol with the Confederate flag, and how they're being coddled now, as opposed to when Black Lives Matter had theirs, how the people, how the um, police were lined up in um, gear that I had never seen before, but on RoboCop, cop, you know. So mm -hmm. when people get to see that, the disparity in the treatment of what they do and how they get really coddled when, when a Dylan Roof can be taken to eat a hamburger after killing nine people. So basically it's glaring at us as to why the disparity then goes down to even the lowest level mm -hmm. when, when we're looking at our lives in this country. You know, they, they make it, um, when, when you're looking at TV, if you're looking at the news, you might see one black person and nine whites. You know, they make sure that you see it visually and you see it in all aspects. And they're teaching these children at two to be dominant, to be the people that they grow up to be like these judges that you see. You know, so um, it's like the 13th Amendment, except for punishment for a crime. That clause is still there. Nobody is trying to take that clause out, which gives them the license to continue to do what they do because they can now criminalize a, a, an eight-year-old and a seven-year-old and that's what's going on. It's in our very fabric of this country. And until, I mean, it's not going to change. Well, I'll, I just want to jump in and say something. This is Dr. Butler again, as far as um, the change. We have to stop expecting the system to do for us. That's the first and foremost. The system is not going to change for us. We are going to have to create our own systems. And I, I'm hearing this and one of the things I said, and we're, we're so disjointed, not unified as a people and as people just of brown, black color skin that, and, and we keep going to the system and the system is, the system's not going to change. If we can't even get the George Floyd bill passed, which we all saw with our own eyes, everybody else, something that's been happening for centuries and decades to us and continually happens. It's not, there's not going to be any movement. We have to take it, and, and I'll say this from the words of Kwame Nkuma. A black man, the, the solution to a black man's problem is a black man. We have to start solving our own problems. And we have to stop waiting for the system to do it because we're not going to do it. We know that, we see it, but we keep going to them and asking them to solve it. We have to collectively unify ourselves. We are not even unified to do enough. We can't go. We just, we, 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 we're, we're so disjointed. And so, and until we ourselves start getting ourselves together, we cannot sit there and think the system's going to do anything for us because it's not going to. We know that, right? And they're telling us every day, they've been telling us the decades, over 400 years, they're not going to do anything for us. And then I want to just say one thing, Marilyn, would you say that you don't see the cross in this? Oh, yes, you do. Oh, yes, you do. You don't see it here. Not as much. You don't see it. No, you see it, you see it enough. And it's enough. Yeah, it's not enough. You see it enough. When they can set the University of Maryland put crosses on people's doors, you see it enough, Maryland. Where you don't hear about it enough. 
You see it happen. I just love California. And California is this great, wonderful state that is so diverse. Honey, they got clay KK all up in there doing all kind of crazy stuff, okay? So, and I was in the valley, and it was just, it was, you see this stuff. And it's happening every day. They don't report it. That's what you don't see. Because the media is going to tell you what they want you to believe and think. And we, got, and, and, I, and I recommend, I, I encourage people to go on some of these other. And Dr. Dyer, I love you say read history. Because remember, that's his story, not our story. We got to learn our story. Once we start learning our story, then we can learn their story. Because we've been taught their story every day. We don't even know our own stories. And so we got to start thinking about learning our stories so that we can then by be a stronger group in a nation here. And I just want to say one thing, because like um, C. Patterson, does anyone know about C. Patterson, who made the first car in the United States? It wasn't Henry Ford. C. Patterson. I, we don't even know our stories. And once we know our stories, we can then have these young people having more self-pride, more understanding that we are, we do come from royalty and royal blood. We can accomplish, but we got to pull ourselves together and start learning more about ourselves. And then, and the positiveness that we bring and the strength that we have and working together before we start acting sister to something. They're not going to do nothing for us. That's all I want to say. I I heartedly agree. I'd like to to know, where would we find our stories? Where do we go, Dr. Butler? Uh, well, I, I agree I, with you. I, I, there, there's I, a lot of places. I, I can help you, Joni, to mm-hmm. where you, and I'll put it in the text the next Wednesday. Thank you. Here's the thing I, this has been brought up, and we got to close this off because we want to talk more because we just don't have the attention span of many. Let me let me tell you something is this. It's not just know the history, but know your history, right? That is what we're talking about. It's not just know the history, but know your history. That will help you understand where you are, where you are not, and where you can go. Because that's important. Because if you don't know your history, then you cannot go anywhere. You know, people are afraid of the Haitians coming to America. How do you We're know? Here. How, We're here. How do you know that? Because they've been afraid since 1806. Oh, four. Oh, four. <laughs> know, know your history, right? There you go. <laughs> they, they have been afraid since then. And they don't want that rebelism into America. Here's your here's your thought pro- process. Believe in what you study, not what you hear. Believe in what you study, not what you hear or in what you believe. You see how that circles? It's confusing. Because it means I want you to keep studying and researching all things. We are living beings. We have a purpose to join unity. But we cannot join if you believe in dot, dot, dot. Marilyn, before we go, we're closing out till next Wednesday. What do you have to say? I think we had a great discussion. I don't know if people want to continue the discussion mm. uh, good. that we started next week, or do you want me to try to get a guest? Well, we don't leave it to them, but next, Judge Chloe Barber is probably busy in doing other things. We will mm-hmm. see everyone next Wednesday, 6 p.m. You Be the Judge is here. Bridges Live presents You Be the Judge, our host, Judge Claudia Barber, Mel and Pierre, soon to be Circuit Court Judge of Montgomery County of Maryland, and Dr. Paul Dyer. Thank you, everyone, for listening, chiming in, and sharing and liking. God bless, be safe, be compassionate, and kindness. Thank you. Thank you.